Welcome back to the Automate Construction Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Gross, and I'm here with Brent Wattis. Brent, thanks for having me at your office today. Great to be here today. Thanks We're for here us. at BotBuilt. You guys have some cool Fanuc machines at the R&D facility you're experimenting with. You just showed me around. I have all kinds of questions for you. Uh, maybe we could start at the beginning of BotBuilt. So what, when did you start the company? What initiated the idea? Was it the same concept you have today? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it's one of those things where for me, I've kind of always been involved in different businesses. I, uh, in the 90s, I guess, I was in the music business, had some great friends, and we had great times uh, producing some awesome tunes. But really around 2001-ish, I guess it was, I started up an RIA. Uh, from that with a buddy of mine, we built out that into a SaaS platform, which is amazing. This guy had a great idea and we kind of ran with that for like a web-based CRM. That was back in the day when, you know, the early aughts, you had to explain to people what the internet was. What is RIA? Uh, sorry, it's a registered investment advisory group. Okay. I apologize. Yeah, a little, little jargon there, a little slander. Uh, and then we built up a SaaS company that was like a easily duplicatable, automatable, systematizable, process-driven CRM that was all on the web. So like mm -hmm. you wouldn't have any software, you wouldn't have any of that nonsense. That's kind of cool. Uh, we built that up, and then around, oh, geez, I'd like to say 08, 09, my wife and I just kind of decided, hey, it's time to go have an adventure. The surge was really getting big in Afghanistan and Iraq, and we wanted to serve and give back. Our girls were getting older. Uh, when the towers fell, I did one of those things I think a lot of people did, where they're like, I'm going to go join the Army. But then you get kind of rich and fat and just goes to the sides. So got a trainer, got myself there, spent a decade in special operations. While I was doing that, I was eventually stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and that is where my cousin's husband was teaching over at Duke, uh, right here down the road from us in Durham. And he would always pitch me different robotic ideas, right? And like he'd always have these businesses and kind of like pitching around this like, hey, it'd be cool if you would help out with this. Or hey, it'd be cool if I got some advice. Or hey, do you want to run this? And some of his ideas were just red hot business ideas. And Barrett Ames is his name, uh, now Dr. Ames. And he had done some incredible work. He put a couple of uh, robonauts on the International Space Station. The guy knows his stuff. Um, but nothing really pulled at my heartstrings until I think he knew the game. He's a smarter salesman than he'd give himself credit for. He knew the game and he knew that I loved investing in housing, but he knew the, how frustrated I was with construction in general. And so he brought up this idea of changing the way that automation and construction works because we had done some basic research and as we dug in deeper to what systems were out there, we realized that, man, you're spending tens of millions of dollars on equipment that still needs tons of staffers working it. And it just wasn't to me. Uh, where the market needed to be to meet the labor demands and the shortage and the crisis we're having, mm -hmm. along with the humanitarian aspect of the labor crisis, which is, I'm originally from Arizona, just so you know, and out west, we suffer through insane heat, and our builders are just put to it in a way that I, I can't literally describe. And to give you a good little analog here, you know, and I signed up for the Army, right? Like, uh, it's real. It's life or death, and people know that. And so when I signed up and raised my right hand, I got an insurance beforehand. My wife was going to be, you know, rich and attractive if I died. And then she can marry someone else who's much better looking than me. And we'd, we'd be all good, right? Good insurance plan. Exactly. Yeah. And she's, she's set. So I don't, but like I signed up for that. We knew going in, eyes wide open, like this could result in my death. You are 10 times more likely to die on a job site in America than you are in Afghanistan during mm -hmm. the height of the war, which makes no sense to me because those cats are just trying to provide for their family. They're just trying to build America. They're just trying to do something respectful. Uh, and, and that's not Murder, Inc. That's not where they should be. Um, so for us, the ability to take really innovative solutions from a software and hardware standpoint and change the game of safety, that was the real idea behind all of this. So Barrett put together some plans from the software side and from the hardware side. Uh, we put together some business plans, brought in some partners, and from there started up in earnest late 2020, early 21. Uh, we did Y Combinator. And really the goal was to end homelessness by increasing the supply of housing through the revolution of automated construction. So there's a lot of gates to hit here through a supply side. You know, we're not asking for communist style government housing. We want everyone to have affordable housing through increasing supply without having to rely on an ever diminishing labor pool and bring those costs down to reasonable letter levels while still having what we would consider truly flexible mass customization. So that means the robots can build any type of structure that they can do anything that is necessary to allow you to not have to live in the same home as your neighbor. Because no one, you know, at the end of the day, some people just have to live in apartments, that's fine, multifamily is cool, but we still want it to have some sense of architecture, some sense of purpose, being, feeling, emotion that art should have. Uh, and so for us, that's written in the code base. We want people to have that opportunity. So that brings us to, through 2022, we really started ramping up 
you know, where we saw the software going, testing out different tooling systems, and then from there just started building houses. We had way more demand than we thought we'd have, but uh, that's a good thing. Wall panels are kind of the future right now of building. As far as building efficiencies go, all the bigs are using them. And so for us, just joining that game has become more of a matter of making sure that we can bring affordable robotic systems to every place that demands it, mm -hmm. and then be able to move those robots from place to place as those markets heat up and cool off, depending on demand, without having gigantic capital expenditures you know, locked into one single factory site. And so that's, uh, that brings us to here and somehow August of 2023. So you go to Y Combinator, and what amount of technology had you developed at that point? Uh, at that point, we had just started really the code base for the software and we had just ordered our robots. Uh, so it was kind of fun in Y Combinator, you know, this isn't my first rodeo. So a lot of Y Combinator is great in the sense that you get to network and meet these amazing gifted people, but some of it's also like business one-on-one stuff, how to calculate MRR, what runway should look like, what your financials need to do, what lawyers need to do, blah, blah, blah. So some of it was uh, not the most insightful, but the connections are, are worth their weight in gold. But it was funny because they'd be like, okay, what do you have for, uh, for business traction? And for us, you know, just on the idea alone that we would start producing panels in the next couple of years, uh, the orders flooded in very quickly. So we had you know, these gigantic order stacks already built up and we still didn't have robots. So it was just kind of fun watching people mm -hmm. just, the demand was that heavy. And so then you'd watch these guys that had started this, you know, they're brilliant gifted computer scientists and maybe they've created a, a Chrome extension to make Chrome faster and they think okay. they've got the next big thing. And they're like, well, we have two orders, one of them with my mom. And I'm like, it's a different business when you're trying to meet a demand for housing, uh, which is so acute and so short right now. Yeah. And so the first robot you developed, what was the tool that robot was using? Uh, at that time, we went through multiple iterations of our stud plate connector. Mm -hmm. So the goal just being, can it pick up a stud, can it place it, and then can it connect it to a plate top or bottom and nail that together? Uh, that first iteration, you know, was very interesting. We did a lot of different experimentation, uh, slow motion cameras on the nails, understanding pressurization of those nails. We were using pneumatic, uh, pneumatic nail gun systems. So understanding all the elements with different types of humidities for the boards, different types of kilns for the boards, understanding how far or how in that nail is going to drive, what we need to vary there. A lot of things you might not think about on a job site that can totally change the quality of your home. Uh, for me personally, it was just about getting it right. We we could be accused of being perfectionists, but for us, it's someone's house. Like someone's going to live in this. It's going to be a structure that you need to rely on. Uh, we're here in North Carolina. You know, our hockey team's called the Hurricanes for a reason. You really need to be aware that what you're building is is solid uh, going forward. So that's, that was our first iteration. From there, we just started working on different ways to grip those studs. And then uh, the next real generational leap was when we started using computer vision to bring those studs into focus and make sure they're brought to that T angle, which matters so much. When did that come into play? <sighs> By late 21, uh, we were really able to start using the CV for what it's intended for. And it is then that we decided to take the leap from using pre-cut lumber that was put in racks mm -hmm. ready to go, which is an efficient system. It was very fast, which is nice. Uh, but we moved from that to just using lumber bunks where the, you know, Lumber deliveries just go right into a stack on each side of the bots and start building from there with relative ease. And so you took on the responsibility of the cuts? Yeah, and that's when we decided to start taking on just vacuum grippering. We built our own, uh, what we call it the auto saw, because that's what it does, automatically cuts. It uses uh, patented devices basically to measure out the lumber exactly, get the cut exactly right, and then pull that lumber back out, put it on the build table, and begin to assemble that wall. So I know the production facility isn't set up for cameras today but the uh main idea there do you have two robotic arms or more what's the yeah so the uh the basic visual is that you'll have two robotic arms one on each side you'll have a lumber bunk of just dimensional lumber a lumber bunk of pressure treated lumber here a sheathing bunk over here and then a header bunk behind the saw area and then what we call i know creative again the tool belt around there is just all the different tools those robots can pick up so they all have uh different types of teeth that they just lock in grip on mm -hmm. pick up the tool and move it over uh so whether it's a sub -plate connector a, a router to actually route out window openings or the free nailer to actually nail in the sheathing or the sheathing gripper for larger pieces it's just a you know variety of tools that each robot on each side can do every function there on that table to make sure that we're you know, really limiting the amount of downtime from each type of arm. That sounds almost the same as the R&D facility. 
Yeah, so the production facility is the same setup now, except it's just twinned. So mm -hmm. we can put robots in certain lines and just have channels for forklifts to bring in more lumber supply and outstations for them to actually drive the trucks up and bring out the actual panels that we've built. So when somebody wants a house built with you guys, do they come to you with building plans already? Uh, yeah, typically what happens, they'll just shoot us over the PDF. Uh, we, you know, the basis of our software, which was really kind of where the, for my money anyway, is where you're really saving the most amount of cash, is the fact that we can take a PDF. If you have CAD, you have AutoCAD, you have Revit, whatever, cool, great, awesome. But a lot of builders just have PDFs from their architects. The ability for us just taking that PDF, run it through the system, allow that system to build out that three-dimensional model. It tells us where every stub will go, every nail placement, every sheathing piece. And from there, it builds out a cost list as well. It tells us every cut that needs to be made. It tells us every piece of material that's going into the framing for that home. Already known. So the builders know their costs right up front. They don't have to do the guess and check method with their mm -hmm. building supply. It comes to them ready to go as here's your cost package. Boom, done. And then from there, it takes that and transfers that over as code to those robots and tells them these are the panels you need to build. And so really the only user interface with the robotic system is just a user going, yes, panel 24 is the next build, enter, go. And those robots will still start building panel 24. So it eliminates that six to eight weeks of you know, revision of a plan into a panelized model. And then that three to four weeks on the good side of reprogramming by hand each robotic line to do that type, particular type of panelization. And right now you have three guys working on the R&D, if it was a production facility, not testing new things, uh, what would the operation or oversight be? Uh, it really depends on where, uh, I guess, where the facilities are. For us, we found for safety purposes, we could have one person overseeing five teams, 10 robots, mm -hmm. fairly safely, uh, without much interference or issues. Uh, we're still a very light team. We're bot built for a reason. Uh, we got, I think, about 20 total, 11 full time. And realistically, it's just a matter of people that need to just watch the robots to make sure that everything's still running smoothly and there are no real errors in the system. But other than that, they can really run without too much human interference, which is the goal here. Yeah, and I'm sure you're increasing the automation every day. Yeah, that's that, honestly like what we're doing here in the R&D lab is really just pushing the limits of what automation can be doing in the construction lines, moving into other material types and other add-ons to the wall, but those will come down the line as these guys work hard. What's the most important catalyst for you guys to grow right now? Uh, really just more robots. So for us, we've got kind of the basic system down. Uh, we're experimenting with a few different builders as to types of builds. So we've got one builder that they've stated their goal is to be the greenest builder on earth. So they want everything done to a particular order. We've got partners with the uh, companies like Owens Corning that help us on the material science side to build more efficient builds, obviously, as far as greenification goes. And then we have builders that are just like, listen, man, I just want eight foot panels all day long. So mm -hmm. for them, it's building out a system that will operate well, that will just crank out eight foot panels all day. And, and they don't have to worry about that just to supplement their framers that they already have. So it really is uh, builder dependent. But for us, what's, the only thing holding us back is number of bots on station. And what do you need to get there more? Will you be raising money or just hiring people yeah. training up? Uh, we'll be, we are raising money this summer, I guess over the next month, starting next week, uh, just to build out a third facility. But mm -hmm. realistically, at that point, it just becomes a model of fulfilling the orders that we already have and then finding new partners and working towards their goals as well. Because each builder, you know, surprise, surprise, each builder is unique and they have their own set of goals and determinations. So building a factory-based system that is site-based, and one thing that your listeners can understand is we build it in the factory, right? We ship the panels to the job site. We're very cognizant of how far that shipping window mm -hmm. really is because we don't just want to be burning diesel fuel just to move your panels there. And the other thing that we think about is the actual limits on what that lumber has been through. So if it's kiln for a North Carolina atmosphere, we're here in North Carolina, it's very humid. Heck, it's raining outside right now, right? It's a wet environment. I wouldn't ship these panels to a place like the deserts of you know North Texas or to Arizona because it's so dry, it's going to contract. Likewise, I wouldn't ship panels from Arizona to a wetter climate because they will expand as they absorb that uh, humidity there. Uh, so for us, it's staying. we'd like to stay within a little 400 mile belt radius of every factory that we have and then we can just plop down factories. And the robots don't need much. They can literally just be on a concrete pad near a large scale development or they can be in a factory setting outside of a large suburb or a large city uh, for multiple shipments into the city at every time. It's interesting lumber can't be transported into climates like that. I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it can be. It's not ideal. Just, yeah, it's not ideal. I know uh, companies like Katera learned that the hard way, uh, shipping stuff up to Seattle back in the day. Uh, from their Arizona facility, they had, you know, hundreds of millions put in this facility in Arizona. Why wouldn't you use it? Uh, but as soon as they shipped it to Seattle, millions, if not tens of millions of dollars of panels just 
seems like they learned a lot of stuff the hard way. Uh, yeah, I mean, and I, I don't want to knock them at all. I think I've said it before, but I, I give them all the credit in the world when they went under. Their executive teams, their engineers were great about sitting down with us and doing, you know, I morbidly call it a post-mortem, but mm-hmm. it, it really was a deep dive into the, how did you die? what mistakes were made along that line. And it came down to really not having an overarching architecture from the technological standpoint and really just making little mistakes like that. But at the level that they were at, that's how you burn through a couple hundred, you know. They seem to have spread themselves thin. Uh, Very much so. And, you know, from from my take anyway, they didn't really patent a whole lot either. So it wasn't real science. It was more aqua science and aqua hire than anything else. And from my perspective, you know this, right? Building is its own culture. You don't just step into building and say, you know, thump your chest and say, this is how we're going to do this now. You need to meet them at their level where they're at and ex- express how they need you to improve their lives, not you tell them how to improve their lives. Building has been working. Like I know all of us in the, like, the nerdery here like to be like, well, we can do it better because we're so intelligent. Like, yeah, but building's still going okay. Like, we have problems, but we're still building every day. So. That's one of my favorite things about the industry is it's kind of naturally decentralized. You get so many differences, even culturally builders in California. You probably saw differences in Arizona to yes. North Carolina. Yes, huge differences. I actually just was speaking with some Saudi builders yesterday, believe it or not. And, you know, when they're looking at these amazing systems and they love our computer vision system, right? Because it takes this lumber that's bowed or warped or bent and it brings it right to the T and they're like, that is incredible. It is really cool. And they're, and then he just laughs for a minute. This uh, doctor from Saudi Arabia just goes, uh, we will never use that. Because <laughs> for them, uh, it is inhospitable to build with lumber in Saudi Arabia. Mm-hmm. They, don't they don't have, have a supply and why would you put wood out in that type of heat? Uh, his joke to me was rather cheesy, but it was appropriate. He just said, listen, you're from Arizona, you have cactus. In Saudi Arabia, it's too hot for the cactus. And, uh, got a kick out of that. Brutal. Yeah, it, it's tough. It's hot in Texas, too. Some of the prints I film, my camera overheats after throw it in the cooler. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, especially this year. Yeah, but uh, did you always want to build off-site? Yes and no. Um, we're realists. So do... Do we want to build on site? You bet. Like, I think that does make a lot of sense when the technology approaches a cost feasibility. The goal here is to bring down the cost to developers, which can bring down the overarching cost to the consumer. Mm-hmm. The on site technology that's available right now, while it's a lot of cool guy stuff, is very expensive, very hard to replicate, and you need a lot of the PhDs that we have here on staff to go and run that stuff. Eventually we're gonna get there, but not all the materials that are best built for the on-site environment that is working right now, like concrete, are viable in every market, nor is it, you know, obviously we've got concerns right now about government interference in the concrete markets regarding its carbon footprint and whatnot. So for us, the best thing that we can do is improve the technology for off-site construction and start working on plans, which we've done now, uh, to build more close to what we call a factory at the foundation. The foundation is just poured in, robots go onto the large development site and ship out panels from there, and eventually move to a trailer-based system that's deployable. And what we'd love to see in the future is our computer vision system works so well and our motion capture systems work so well that, yeah, your robots are going to be putting up the walls themselves. Right now, that technology is still in the nascent stages, and we're not here to push that on the consumers and make them pay that price. Once you get into vision learning, like with the studs, straightening them out, picking and placing. Uh, how similar is that to like Tesla full self-driving? Um, not very, I guess not very in the sense that for us, it's, it's a change that happens in a static environment that we can iterate through every time. Mm-hmm. Tesla full self-driving and, and systems like that are dealing with so many different variables that are constantly having to predict, you know, the point is here now, will that obstruction be here then, and how fast? And there's so much math involved there that that is such a much harder problem to solve. What if you made it Tesla full self-driving on a closed track? That gets closer, as long as you don't have any of those pop-up obstacles, then yeah. we're talking the right things. Uh, but for on-site robotics, it's definitely going to be similar, just not at the same speed. Uh, the only thing you're going to have to involve there is just human safety elements, which are a different bit when you have, I don't know if you've been at or seen any of Amazon's more automated warehouses, they have no-go zones. And when those yellow lines are delineated, it is an automatic you're fired if you cross those lines. And that seems super harsh, yes, but they are dead serious about not having people lose their life because they crossed a line. Uh, and on-site construction will involve much of the same thing. You really don't want to mess with a 2,500-pound chunk of steel coming at you, so it's much easier to just have no-go zones than it is to calculate every type of human behavior, which is what you know 
unfortunately, Tesla's going to have to deal with. Yeah, certainly. I drove over a tire one time on autopilot. It's not fun, but uh, <laughs> yeah. those unexpected things, a couch could fall off the truck or it, something. It's just like that. Just UFO like that. lands on yep. the street. Yep. Hey, it happens. The uh, hiring or fundraising means building out another facility you guys will be hiring right so what kind of positions are you looking for uh, right now we're looking for more computer vision experts so if anyone out there is a computer vision expert and really wants to get involved in solving the largest problem in the world uh welcome to the bot build uh we're looking for folks that understand robotics uh in computer science that's not always the same married up facility or if you have particular set of skills in mechanical or electrical engineering and you'd like to try something new and deal with some of these wild beasts give us a ring Go to botbuilt.com or you can email me directly at brent at botbuilt.com and I will get back to you. It's just that simple. Are there any tools on the horizon or other things you're looking to automate? Uh, really for us, we're starting to iterate on the what I call the good, better, and best wall, right? So the good wall is what we're doing now. You want sheathing and, and interior walls, exterior walls done, cool. Our robots are doing that today. That's the homes that we're building today have all of that framing done for their wall systems. Really, though, for us, it comes down to iterating on what's next in that material chain. So is it the routing of electrical and plumbing that's necessary? Absolutely. Then we got to start talking about the insulation and the products that are going in those walls. So there's just one less trade uh, that has to get in there and possibly mess up the framing. So one of the things that we hear from a lot of the major builders that we work with is they'll have all the framing done. And before that inspector comes out, that's when the, like, the ninja plumber or the ninja electrician with their sawzall comes on in and just starts wrecking things, like just slicing through everything they can. Then, of course, the inspector comes out and says, you failed inspection, and I can't come out for another four weeks, and your site is just now delayed. That's real money going out the door for the builder, and that cost gets passed along, as the reality often is, back to the consumer. Uh, so for us, the ability to make it much easier to have more of a plug-and-play style wall is really what's next. Yeah, that doesn't sound very different from a regular construction site. I mean, your finished wall product, is it any different from a hand-built stick the wall no just with robotic precision so the robot literally cannot allow itself to build something that's out of spec uh, whereas humans were just i've had to accept this fact working with barrett over the years we're not as fast at math we're not as good at cutting we're not as good at just making sure that that board is straight and true where the robots literally are programmed to take the image understand the image see if it's right or wrong and move on from there uh, and weed out the error so it's a it's just a, an improvement, I guess you would say, using robotic precision. Yeah, absolutely. And your earlier entrepreneurial experience, it was the software automation company or were there other businesses you started? Uh, those are the main two. I mean, I was raised in a very entrepreneurial household. My mother is just a, a boy, just a killer in advertising. She She's dominated the space for as long as I've been alive. Um, She's a force to be reckoned with. She's a great shot, too, by the way. I got in trouble in Army basic training because someone asked me how I learned to clear a room so well. And I made the mistake at the time. Sorry, Mom. I was saying, well, my mama said. And they're like, oh, what does his mama say? So then it was like kind of a running joke uh, up until graduation. Uh, but she's just a very high-powered, high-performance, you know, always had her name on the door type of person. And then my father is the same way. He's a gastroenterologist by trade. Uh, it's one of the more disgusting uh, medical <laughs> fields out there, but he's good at like great at it. And he's really built up an empire of training the next generation of science from that field. So I just grew up in a household. Uh, my mother was raised by a grandfather who after World War II started a company called World Seeds. Mm. Uh, really look that up someday if you want something in your board. Uh, it was a scientific sharing agreement between the US and the USSR. The man was dealing with then science minister Mikhail Gorbachev. I mean, this is in my DNA. So it just wasn't like, oh, you're going to grow up and you go work for XYZ and you go do a thing. It's just, no, you build a business, you provide jobs, you build out something that creates a lasting impact and you do well by doing good. Uh, so even with the music stuff, it was very entrepreneurial originally. And then I would just find new ways to channel that energy into something that matters for, you know, not just me personally, but truly some type of social impact through that business. Do you use any of the advertising tricks you picked up from your mom for Bot Built? Uh, oh. I try, and mom, I'm failing you, and I'm sorry. So if you're watching this for whatever reason, I'm guessing you're too busy to. But Seems like you guys are doing pretty good here. We're doing okay. It's just, uh, for me, to be blunt, like when I went into the Army and I did some things that were with people that we weren't, we were scraped off the Internet, right? We were sure. supposed to not exist. We were, we were supposed to just not be flashy about what we're doing. You don't want to give away location, so on and so on. 
And uh, the Army is, if nothing else, a great brainwashing institution <laughs> where I really got that drilled in. So I'm, we have a team now that's working with me to bring that back out and bring my mom's old tricks back to, to really get the name and the brand voice uh, as loud as it needs to be. It must have been fascinating seeing media and the Internet shift and all the different places people are watching stuff change. Uh, very much so. I mean, you know, just from little things like, you know, YouTube to big leaps in advancement, that instant technology, you know, we went from Vines over to the instant, you know, the, just watching those reels or seeing how people on TikTok can just connect and communicate one with another. It, it's an amazing resource that just allows so many different people to have a voice or to have an ear to things they would never have exposure to. Uh, that, you know, you can travel the world in the palm of your hand for 15 minutes and just be enlightened and educated. And I think that's pretty cool. Or yeah. watch cat videos because, you know, watching a cat like slowly push something off a ledge is hilarious. I don't know. TikTok's a funny one. Yeah. It was, I have a much younger brother who put me on to TikTok. He said I should be posting my shorter YouTube videos there. Oh. And uh, I thought it was for kids. Meanwhile, here three years later, the average age in my TikTok audience is 35. So there's, everybody downloaded it at some point. Uh, yes. It's weird yes. how things grow like that. It's amazing. That's amazing. I've got a couple of daughters. One's uh, 23, the other's 17. So they've, they've schooled me up on, you know, kind of what I missed when I was on the dark. I'm waiting for an app where you hold your phone diagonally. <laughs> it's coming. Don't you worry. It's coming. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, do your kids ever work with you here? Uh, on occasion, yeah. They'll come in and help out. They've got their own little, you know, skill sets and aspirations. My oldest daughter is a very gifted writer, and she's, you know, very talented in that. She just got married recently, which is exciting. Congratulations. Uh, uh, to a soldier, so I have no moral authority to stand on that. He's a great dude. Uh, and then my youngest daughter is a very, like, I know I'm very critical of kids' art. I'm just going to own this right now. I used to go to this website back in the day called uh, maddoxmission.com. It was called The Greatest Website in the Universe. And he had this whole page dedicated to it his co-worker's kid's art that he would grade so harshly. And I thought that was funny. Uh, but my youngest daughter is uh, just a brilliant artist. So our focus right now is helping build her portfolio to, to move on to where she wants to be as far as directing and, and film. Cool. Yeah, it's a good time. I'd love to have them here, but uh, they, uh, they don't appreciate the math. Yeah, so. they can find their own thing to do exactly. like you did. Exactly. And I think that's the best way to do it. So Very cool. Yeah. And so you're hiring, you're raising money, you're growing in new locations. Um, what are some of the places, other states outside of North Carolina you built homes? So we've built homes so far in North Carolina and Arkansas. And if I'm forgetting a state, forgive me. But we're now looking at Florida and Texas as our next little jump. And then from there, move out to the western states, which need their own type of needs. You know, cities like Phoenix, Denver, Salt Lake that are just growing in ways that are exponential compared to most average Midwest cities. Uh, really do need the assistance, both from a weather perspective, and you know this in Texas right now. I've, I've actually got a, a younger half-brother, Zach, who's just started playing baseball at TCU, who also makes a huge presence on TikTok, by the way. He's the one that turned me on to that as well. Cool. Uh, and my dad came back from moving him into his dorm, my dad from Arizona, saying it is hotter than Arizona here. So we need to be putting factories out there to really enable those builders to keep growing at the same clip that they are because the people are moving there. Uh, I think well, last time I was down in Florida for a convention uh, a month ago, they told me they were growing at 1,000 people a day, which is insane. And so we really need to be putting those factories there in the high growth states and then start thinking about states that have less good build weather days. And so Q4, 24 on to Q1, 25, then from looking at the Northeast and into Canada, which you know just have, because of weather, limited build days available to them. Of all the groups that say they do prefab automation, a lot of them are just guys swinging hammers in a facility so it's good to see we'll do a live video of the robots moving and you guys are actually using automations in your facility uh and another really strong advantage you have is you're building a home that's can get a mortgage and home insurance so it's not a trailer it's not a mobile right home. it doesn't have special laws affixed to that mortgage it is on its own it's just a home it's built out we just ship it on one flatbed truck to the job site offload those panels and that home is up within two and a half to three hours it really is incredible to watch. And yeah, you're going to see some cool stuff here in the R&D facility. It's R&D labs, so who knows what will happen. Stuff might fall. Robots might hit me. I don't know. We're going to try and be safe. Uh, but if I die, Colin is now the CEO, and uh, we'll just have a good day from there. But yeah, it's a lot of fun out there. A ton of fun. Very cool. Uh, we must have missed some stuff. Uh, the 
Are you the only founder or the other? other no, I've got two other co-founders. Uh, so Barrett, uh, Barrett uh, Ames is one, and the other one is Colin Devine. So those are my two main co-founders. We've got a litany of partners that have worked with us over the years that have really helped us out. Uh, you know, for me, it's about meeting not just the market demand, but the cultural demand. So we have builders on our team that really understand how to build more efficiently. And so when we're building a software solution for taking a 2D plan, turn into a 3D model, it's not just about panelization. It's about panelization that makes sense for the builder. Stuff you would normally think about. For me, I think like, oh, well, wall panels. So the minimum number of panels we can ship is X. That's more efficient in my head. So what if we just built like 20 to 30 foot panels? And then the builders that we first started working with in Northwest Arkansas and Bentonville, Fayetteville, like where Walmart and Tyson Chicken and J.B. Hunt are all headquartered, they're like, no, 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 I get three to four people on a job site. Those things cannot weigh over 500 pounds, mm. eight feet, limit it. Uh, so it changes our parameters, changes the way we build the net out, changes the way that we actually build out the panel system. Uh, but having that cultural understanding of the why, and then you see those guys build it, and three people can put up an 1,800 to 2,400 square foot home in a few hours, that changes their world, it changes their environment, makes it much safer and easier, but then you start to understand why, culturally speaking, you can't just apply the math and hope for the best. You actually have to understand on the job side what the boots on the ground are dealing with and go from there. Have you seen the Tesla Optimus bot that they're thinking of launching? Or I've seen a few of those, uh, I guess full disclosure. I don't know, I'm not a registered investment anymore, but uh, I do own Tesla stock and I'm a big fan and booster of them. Uh, my dad has turned from a you know, gastroenterologist to a NASCAR driver, thanks to Tesla. So uh, I have seen their bot stuff. I think what they are doing, I guess it seems unrealistic to a lot of robotics people, right? But I think when you deal with a person like Elon Musk, now I don't know if you've read like the, uh, I think it's called Lift Off, the kind of official uh, biography of SpaceX, so to speak, you sort of realize that you're dealing with a man that will probably get it done. So I would I'll bet against a lot of people if I know the math well and say that's not real. Elon's one I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt and say even if I don't fully think the math is there, he'll find people that can get it there. And that's, a, that's an impressive entrepreneur. Yeah, we're pretty aligned on that. And he says it's going to be $50,000. So would that be a tool you'd add to your toolkit? <sighs> Elon right now, send me the LOI. I'll sign it. I'll sign it today. When you get him here, you get him here. I'll sign it today. But yes. If rates weren't so high, maybe if we could finance one too, we'll see what happens when they honestly, come out. Honestly, also as a day two deposit on my cyber truck, if you can move me to a day one, that would really change my timeline for delivery. I'd appreciate that very much. You got in on day two? Yeah, day two. Day nice. Two. Do you know what that puts you in the list or what number? <laughs> well, last time I was in their Scottsdale office, uh, they just kind of laughed when I asked for us that in timeline. So that was last year late. Um, yeah, when it gets here, it gets here. I, for me, it's really about the revolution that he's brought about to the automotive industry, right? Everyone else needed someone to go through the breach. They needed someone to say, I first and foremost will create electric vehicles that are affordable and no one else thought it could be done. GM tried to take them out, Ford tried to take them out, and now they're all following rather than leading. And you just have to respect the crap out of that. And they still can't figure out the margins. Right? Except for Tesla. Yep, that's a, that's a real issue. And so it's something that's amazing on top of going zero to 60 in under three seconds. Like that's just disgusting. Love it. Yeah, I think I'm order number like 270,000 or something. So that's, hey, when it gets here, it gets here. And then we'll, we'll have our truck. That's a good thing. Yeah, stainless steel should last forever. I mean, if you've watched Back to the Future and you like trucks, it just adds up. I think so anyway, yeah. It's hard not to be a Tesla fan these days. <laughs> it really is. It really but uh, is. are you on Twitter? Uh, no. Uh, that's something I'm working on building more of a presence to. I started a Twitter account years ago when Twitter first stood up. Um, I did Twitter for a lot of our clients. We did congressional consulting for mm -hmm. a couple of election cycles back in the day uh, when Twitter still had the fail whale going. Um, but I'm trying to get out there a little bit more, and you'll see that as our, our brand folks over at SNA start to, to build out our Twitter and, and Facebook presence a little bit more. Twitter's like the only platform I can't get a million views on. <laughs> Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, Twitter's the only one that won't yeah, give me the algorithm. They're still working out the math on that. It'll, it'll take some time. It'll take some time. I think it's on me. I just, I'm posting like the other social media's Twitter's different somehow. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean... I have faith. I have faith it'll work out. But yeah, I think uh, Insta's definitely been a lot more open, I guess. But even their shifts over the last two years. My daughter does a lot with her art on Insta, and it's just been mm -hmm. just watching her have to shift so much so continuously. It reminds me of the early days of like SEO with Google, and they'd change their algorithm once, and suddenly like all of us would have to shift our entire website platforming just to 
you know, make sure we have the breadth and depth requisite. It was just a, it's, it's still the Wild West days, basically, of, of content management. You went through a huge, unprecedented flux in lumber prices from when you guys started. It was pretty cheap, then it went crazy, and then cheap again. How did that affect you guys? Um, thankfully, it didn't really affect us too much, but it did add into us a drive to understand that our ability to know our costs right up front, because we scrape in market data into our system every time it's pulling what your cut list is, that just became a huge sales pitch for us, basically. Mm -hmm. So that, that lumber fluctuation for builders who are now, I mean, you saw it the worst of it, right? That 16, 1700 bucks uh, on the market that it was charging, we saw builders walking away from projects because they could not afford to finish them or they could not make a profit off of it at the end of the day. Uh, that's a problem. So for our ability to say, hey, if you buy now, lock now, this is your exact cost that build. They know those costs going in. They can be eyes wide open to the actual, you know, whoever is on the other end of that loan. And that makes things a lot easier. So it really engaged us on the software side to just think more about those market fluctuations when suddenly lumber went from that, you know, it was like a two to $300 band that would always be in, kind of always existed in, those wild, you know, COVID era fluctuations. It's part of the commodities market. The trading is real and you just have to be able to anticipate it. So is it a home buyer that says, I'd like to use your system? Or is it a builder that says, I don't want to use my framers, send me the prefab? Um, it's actually builders that say, I want my framers to build more. Because uh, we still use framers on the job site. They're the ones connecting the panels. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, builders and developers that come to us and say, we're not building fast enough. Our framing is not passing inspection enough. What can we do to build with you? And from there, they send us their plans. We show them our panel book. Uh, basically what their plan would look like as panelized. It has a little one pager in the front that tells the framers one goes to two, two goes to three, three connects here in the middle at five, four is here, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, makes it very easy on them. And so it's mainly developers coming to us just saying, I need to build more with less. What do you have? Is there a training process for framers using your system? That's a great question. We, uh, I will own that we kind of nerded out on how framers will actually work with our system. And so we did what nerds do, and we just way overthought it. Like, my goodness, we're thinking it has to be language agnostic, it has to be color agnostic, it has to have a number system that makes sense, it has to have connecting limits, blah, blah, blah. And when we got to our first build ever, and it's a monumental occasion, and the panel book is there, it's got 80 panels of just glory right there. The dude rips off all the panels, drops on the floor, looks at the one pager, and just goes, eh, okay. And then starts connecting those panels as it shows on that one little diagram on the front page. Uh, when I was down on a different build, the framer took me aside and politely but sternly told me, sir, I can count. Off you go. And so it was just a, uh, the training really is just, because they're building the panels, standing them up and nailing them together on the job site. It's just someone else is cutting all that mm -hmm. lumber. They get it wrong. They made a measurement wrong. They chalk lined wrong, blah, blah, blah. We just take all that off the equations. Now all they have to do is pick the panel up, nail it in just as they would anything else. They're used to that motion. They know that motion well. They just don't have to do all the nonsensical math beforehand on that job site in either freezing or overly hot conditions and then hope for the best that their Sawyer's doing his job. Contrary to a lot of the different types of construction automation companies I visit, it seems like they're not having to learn a new process. They're just getting a couple steps off their shoulders. Uh, again, like it's, you know, this is just basic stuff the Army taught me. You want some Afghan national to learn how to fire his weapon properly? Well, how does he fire it currently? cool let's start there as a baseline and build around those practices rather than just revolutionize what he's been doing for 15 years uh, working with builders framers they are hard-working individuals that have a system built in their head it's muscle memory for them if we were to disrupt that muscle memory we're just going to disrupt every practice that to a degree does work well just slowly or you know very high cost we're not here to make the automation make you change. We're here to enable you through automation. Think of us as a power tool or a platform that builders and developers can just build faster with. That simple. As you scale, will you guys continue to operate all of your manufacturing facilities? That's yet to be seen. I think for larger builders and developers, they've made it very clear to me that they would like to own their own facilities mm -hmm. and just license our stuff. Uh, as that business model works out, we'll, we'll work through those issues as they come up for now the hub and spoke model of us owning our, our own facilities is great. We also, again, just being scientists, we like to own the data at all times and have access to it. And when you're working through an intermediary, if you don't have instant access to that data, it can be a little bit hairy. But as the system grows and matures, I, I do foresee a world in which that becomes a very viable option, especially for your top five builders. And then for large scale multifamily and commercial builders, they're not here to wait in line behind you know anyone in the bottom 80.
it's cool that you guys were using AI in 2021, kind of before this whole AI wave. Yeah, I think, you know, there, there are certain tech trends that kind of drive me a little bit bonkers, uh, especially in the fundraising world. Like there was a, a period of time in 2021 when if you just like ran outside and yelled, I'm starting a fintech company, someone would give you bags of cash. It was just the weirdest thing, right? And I think investors have learned the hard way, unfortunately, uh, that they really have to vet this stuff. And when people say crap, they better be able to back it up and show you behind the curtain a little bit. Um, for us, it's not about the cool buzzwords. It's just literally about using things that generative technology can give us into the future. So having the robots, the ability to understand where they need to move, how they need to move, what their obstacles are, what, how they can get around those obstacles, all those types of things that just involve so much thought that a permutation through mathematics can run through very quickly, is just a tool to enable them. Uh, you know, we're, I, I see that generative products, GPT, et cetera, et cetera, will have large market impacts both on a reality world in which they can build and improve the way that we understand and synthesize data, but it will also have those fun, kitschy things, you know, uh, that just generate some goofy art piece on the internet and then you can send it to your friends and have fun with that. Uh, but the reality is, is the math behind these models and the large waves that they are will eventually enable better tooling systems, not just for robotics companies, but for most types of business practices. We just haven't seen where that will take us yet. And I think now, you know, if you follow this stuff in the news, you're seeing that the original GPT model that's been marketed is currently struggling with basic math problems because some of those little tweaks on the side and the periphery of that issue have caused waves in the code line and code base that have now created issues where it's gone from solving very complex problems to struggling with basic equations. Uh, so we still have a lot to learn as a, as a society of scientists to bring those fruits to the market. But for us, it's just all about, hey, make my robots better. Yeah, I was an OpenAI paying member since 2021. And nice. they used to have the a version, they claim it was weaker, but it was less bridled. And so it would say anything. Like you yeah. could ask it for nuclear bomb in ingredients yes. and it would yes. spit them out. Uh, Which now is... it's much safer. It shouldn't do that probably. <laughs> we'll test it later. Uh, no, but it's, but it's fun and it can, you know, it's, it's an easy way if I ask it, you know, show me XYZ principle of mathematics and do it in a style of ice cube wrapping, it's going to give that to me. And I think that's a, that's a cool tool to engage, especially young minds, uh, more towards STEM. Uh, but we have yet to see it, I guess, be utilized in a way that it, true business case will enable more Yeah, that was kind of my question. Like the chat GPT stuff seems very consumer facing and it impresses like the everyday person. But the important stuff like the TensorFlow style cameras that you guys are using, and it's not that, but it's a different kind of camera, AI. Uh, that stuff has been around for years now. Uh, has this resurgence of AI excitement changed that stuff or is it just trotting along as it was? Uh, it's definitely changed it. And I think like anything, when there's heat applied to it, right, it will mm -hmm. expand. So we're going to see more people hop into this space, which is going to be great. I'm very excited about that next gen worker that wants to come here and do some revolutionary nonsense with really crazy robots and do these amazing things. The, the thing that I think about is uh, our staff here is, at least compared to me and my bald self, like very young, right? So I look at these guys and they are brilliant, gifted scientists, mathematicians and construction workers that get it. The next big thing in robotics is sitting in the brain of some 15 year old. She's just like typing away, playing with GPT right now. She's playing with some code base right now she's going to change the world and we don't even see her yet, right? And that's why I'm most excited about this stuff getting more attention is I think more people will come into these types of mentalities thinking, okay, how can I improve the world through this science? And, and of course, we're making the case that if you really want to improve the world, change lives by giving them housing. At a lot of big companies, things get political. People want to never have their projects fail. Gets, people want credit for things. Uh, you obviously have to have nothing to do with any of that stuff because you guys are trying to innovate, do new stuff. So how do you preserve the culture of having giving people the confidence to try new things and innovate? Uh, don't want to give away too much of the secret sauce, but small teams wins the day for me. Uh, if you give people small dynamic teams, and this is nothing new, by the way, right? I don't know if you've heard of like Jeff Bezos' two pizza problem, yeah. right? Like the, if your team is so large that two pizzas will not feed that team, you're probably going to fail in that meeting. Like that meeting will have too many individuals there. Sure, there are companies that require hundreds and hundreds of coders or hundreds and hundreds of employees and thousands of sales staff, and that does make sense. But by keeping them included in the small teams, this is something that we've tried to adopt. Uh, one thing I loved about, uh, I was in special operations, not special forces, but I worked with a lot of special forces groups. They operate in very small teams of 12, right? Uh, those are done with a purpose. Each member of that team has a unique job set. Now, they can do all the baseline tasks, but they all have a 
very specific, whether it's their 18 Fox who understands his radios and your signals guy basically, or your, your Delta who's your medic or your Bravo who understands foreign weapon systems. They've got a subspecialty that they bring value to that team and they all work as a whole cohesive unit. When you grow that team out to a large bureaucratic mess, decision processes get jumbled, really the line of authority gets messed up mm -hmm. and things can become insular to where you are getting political or trying to protect your pet project or you want to see things succeed because you did it and put your name on it. Uh, we do try to inculcate a culture where small teams win and where at the end of the day, if you are humble about your process, we're going to reward the success to everyone. You don't need to brag. You don't need to boast. You don't need to defend or worse. You don't need to start to cut down others just to make yourself look better. You literally can work as part of a team and a cohesive unit here. And really, at the end of the day, for my money anyway, teams are what will win, not individuals that just do cool guy nonsense. Yeah, it seems like the military is pretty good at training teamwork. It's very, very efficient at that. And that's something that, you know, uh, when you actually get into battle, you realize the axioms of your basic training class, your infantry school class, your ranger school class are all true, right? You suddenly aren't like remembering when stuff gets real, you're not fighting for the constitution or the United States or the government or the people and freedom and blah, you're fighting literally for the person next to you. And that is such a game changer when it comes down to that. I, you know, I still wear on my wrist the name of Jonah Russell. Uh, he died 10 years ago in July, actually. Uh, so he's like a very, very valued person. He died defending a position that I held. Like, that's incredible that a dude that I went to infantry school with, who's from my home state of Arizona, would give his life so that I can live. Like, that's what teamwork is all about to me. It's about being able to give the ultimate full measure uh, to your team, not worrying about self. And here at BotBuilt, we are very intentional in our hiring to make sure that the people that are coming here want to really change the world, that want to do it as a part of a team, and we've got some of the most humble and intelligent engineers, which, as you probably know, does not always go hand in hand. Uh, but here we are. Yeah, that's awesome. It's fascinating insight to the technology, a little bit of the human aspect of your business. Uh, really cool to see. And is this the, have you been in this location for the whole since Y Combinator? Uh, yeah, this was our first little location here, this R&D lab. Uh, it's a smaller facility, obviously, and then we've expanded out down the road a little ways to a larger facility, and then the next facility will be a little bit further down to the south, so we'll take more of the, uh, the robot build out there. But yeah, this is, this is where it kind of all began, I guess. Did you go to Duke? Uh, I did not. Barrett taught there. Colin was going for his PhD at Duke as well, actually, and Barrett did his PhD at Duke, too. Um, I love Duke basketball because my mm -hmm. dad, I guess, went to some gastroenterology seminar in the 80s and told me about this. My dad is a, you know, a Polish descent, raised Catholic, and then he met this guy who comes from the Army, but he's going to be this great coach told me about named Krzyzewski. And I think you're going to love him, Brent. From then on, I was hooked. So we're, we're still big Duke fans. And uh, I've met a lot of cool, different, interesting people in my life. And Coach K, when I met him, I was working for General Brown, who played for Coach K at Army at West Point back in the day. Uh, and I was working for General Brown, and Coach K came to give like a seminar on leadership. I got to meet him. I totally became a fanboy. Like it was mm -hmm. just disgusting. I was just like, "Ah, oh, here, I'm amazing." No, I'm like, whatever. It's He's, a huge part of the culture here, right? In it, Durham? Very much so. Very much so. Sides are chosen. We've got Chapel Hill just down the road. Um, it, it's kind of remarkable. And then NC State. It, it creates a unique experience. North Carolina Central's right here. I'm from Arizona, where schools are kind of well known and established, but they're hundreds of miles apart. Uh, North Carolina is interesting because you can just trip and fall over a small school somewhere, so it's, it's always interesting. Are there any collaborations you do to help train the future generation? Yeah, so we work on two levels. One with high schools, uh, that's more the like introduction of not just the trades again, you know, because I don't know what your high school was like, but we didn't have a shop class when I was growing up. Uh, and that's a real loss for, for American workforces in general. Uh, you know, it's, to my generation, like Gen X onto, I think millennials too heard it, but the, the idea of like working in the trades is a bad word, mm -hmm. right? They'd be like, no, you got to go to college or else you'll be one of them. And now like I'm paying my plumber $375 an hour. So I'm like, really, am I the loser or, cause I think he's making more than me right now. Um, Does Gen Z understand that now, do you think? I think they're getting there. And I think they're learning to value that more. Gen Z is, you know, every generation, uh, says the generation coming up is all the usual suspects, right? Everyone calls called my generation lazy and weird. We had, you know, grunge music and piercings everywhere and blah, blah, blah. And we were going to fail. And then we created this gigantic wealth machine that everyone lives off of. Millennials got this 
you know, they were too in touch with their feelings and things got super weird, but guess what? They're the most creative generation we've ever seen in our lives. Gen Z gets after it. Like, they just get after it. So we're seeing some real wins there from their generation. So I think the more that we can inculcate in them, hey, all work matters if you take pride in your work. That, at the end of the day, will lift up your heart and that'll lift up your mind and we can make an economy that matters for that. I think really works. And then we work with stuff like trade schools and universities so that, you know, whether it's a, an explicit program, like Denver University has a great construction management program. Shout out to Dr. Eric Holt, right? Like all these incredible programs that are teaching people about the next gen construction. Clemson has a program similar to that as well about automation and construction. Uh, or it's just business owners that need to understand it. We're helping them out. And then for the trade schools around here, it's about working with them so they can get their students in with our robots to understand, like, if you're going to go into the trades, HVAC, construction, electrical, whatever it might be, the future is sitting out in my factories right now. You need to learn how to work with these robots so that they will be the next tool in your tool belt. Yeah, and to them, what was your dream years ago is now a reality. And so you wanted to have robots doing framing. They can see the robots doing the framing. It's so much easier for them to take that leap. It's unreal. And, you know, my dad, when he was teaching at, uh, he started teaching in a medical school part-time just for funsies, I guess. Because uh, he didn't work enough. I'm kidding, Dad. I know you work too much. Uh, uh, he would say that his students would come to class in YouTube, right? They would see all of his lectures already. And so they're coming into class more educated than he was leaving medical school when they're starting day one. Wow. I think this next generation is no different. All of those things that were dr like pipe dreams for my generation about what's possible, they're like, yeah, that's old news. What's next? And so they're planning out what's next. And so we really want to make sure that, that next generation understands like, hey, you want to build the future? This, this is how you're going to do it. Really cool. It's incredibly available. And I think it gets people more excited, even if the Gen Z is ready to do blue collar jobs. I think they'd rather work with the robots. Uh, oh, I mean, I turned five years old and I'm super duper old. I turned five years old every time I go into that factory because you're watching this giant beast just move around lumber like it's nothing. It's fun. It's like a Tonka truck. Exactly. Precisely like a Tonka truck. Exactly. Cool. Well, on that note, maybe we should head in there to get a live video going. Let's go see what's happening. Cool. Thanks. Sounds man. good. Of course. Thank you.